This is super interesting. It's been making the rounds in the Asian community, and it's uh, there's a bit of a juicy controversy going on there. I'll, I'll explain the, the paper first. So this is a, a new paper from the David Sinclair Lab testing or claiming to test the information theory of aging. Now, this is one of the most interesting theories in, in the aging field, and it basically says the reason why we get old is this loss of epigenetic information with age. And what that means is... Um, the way our cells operate is they, uh, the cells know how to function because the cell reads the genetic information in, in our genome. But with age, cells lose the ability to read the, the, the genetic uh, material because of this loss of epigenetic um, information, which causes cells to lose identity. Uh, David Seclair uh, explains it as a CD with scratches that accumulate with age that prevent the, uh, prevent reading of the information on the CD. Wait, wait, Adam. So what I never understood about this information theory of aging is I thought this was pretty like well known. I thought this was common consensus. So I don't really understand what the difference is between what Sinclair says and what exactly. we've already known for decades. So that's what uh, people say is like, um, this is this has been in like the hallmarks of aging since like forever. Uh, <laughs> lots of epigenetic, <laughs> epigenetic information has been like a hallmark of aging. It's not the single driver of aging, but it's like one of, but the theory, I mean, what's, it's a bit different in mechanism, but it's also different in the fact that this is kind of the, um, the upstream ultimate cause of, uh, of aging. And then everything else is kind of downstream from uh, loss of epigenetic information. That's the, that's the idea. The way they tested it in this paper is that they induced DNA breaks in, so they brought a few mouse and m mice and they gave them certain chemicals that induce breaks in their DNA. But mm -hmm. then your cells kind of uh, naturally uh, repair those breaks, right? But when, they, when you repair those breaks, it doesn't go back to exactly the way it was. It's kind of like uh, cutting a, a wire and then welding it back together. There's a bit of a change there, right? And, mm -hmm. it, and so they did that. Uh, this, the cells aged, but then what they did is they gave it, they did some, uh, another intervention that they, they call uh, reprogramming, epigenetic reprogramming, where they remove these kind of uh, chemical um, alterations of, of DNA that happen w w with repair. And then that, w that kind of reduced the, uh, the age of, of the organism of the, of the mice. Um, so there's the, the it's a, it's a beautiful paper. I loved it because it's uh, it's really well written. It's really it's a really elegant theory. But like it, it created a bit of a stir in the in the scientific community because um, loads of other aging um, labs have came out to say to like question this paper, and they even uh, kind of insinuate that there's a bit of uh, I wouldn't say fraud, but it's kind of hype that is unwarranted so if i'm understanding correctly they take some dna in mice they cause some breaks in it then they fix those breaks and then that tells us something about his information theory of aging is that correct well yeah basically how it goes is they uh, induce the breaks the organism fixes the breaks um but the organism still ages uh, rapidly even after fixing the breaks because because what changed here is the um the epigenome so the breaks uh, are still are intact the dna is intact but it's uh, it's more like um the epigenetic signature has, has changed then what they do is they basically inject the mice with these uh, modified viruses carrying certain genes that reverses these epigenetic changes and this uh, leads to gain of function and it leads to kind of re reducing the uh, age related um changes that, has, that have happened and this kind of the age-related uh, changes in in muscle and kidneys and in, in um, the eyesight of the mi mice so it actually does do, do something which is quite interesting fine so they cause some breaks they let the organism fix it itself then once the organism has fixed it itself that has in some ways aged a little bit and then they inject it with something that then reverses this whole process and then that kind of give some proof or some evidence for his information uh, theory of aging? Is that yeah, right? the, the, I mean, that's the conclusion they make. They say that we were able to uh, accelerate aging and then reverse aging at will. And that's where it gets a bit into the, the hype territory because what people say is that 
breaking DNA itself, uh, regardless of loss of epigenetic uh, information, causes aging anyway. There's also an issue of the measurement of aging. So the measurement of aging in mice ha has been reversed in, in some way, but um, not in, in every single way. There's also a question of, so this was a, a tweet by Matt Cabellane, who is uh, kind of a bit of a rival of, of, of David Sinclair. <laughs> He's, uh, uh, he works at a different lab. I think they worked together in the past or something. Um, but he he's done this before where they produced kind of research that contradicts the findings of the Sinclair la lab. So he said something like, actually, I'll read his tweet. It was, he said, rocket ship emojis and press releases aside, right? This is like kind of a dig at Sinclair and press, uh, like focusing on press releases and tweets rather than the, the science. Um, we are seven years on from the first in vivo report, in vivo means in, in, in animals, uh, of anti-aging from epigenetic reprogramming. Epigenetic reprogramming is, is the name of this therapy um, in a mouse. And so far, nobody has done better than rapamycin or anywhere close to calorie restriction. So rapamycin and calorie restriction are kind of the interventions with the highest level of evidence uh, of uh, uh, reversing or uh, slowing the um, age-related decline in mice. Um, and so he's, he's basically say, saying we're, we're seven years on doing epigenetic reprogramming and we haven't even re produced results that are near what we already do with rapamycin or calorie restriction. So um, he's kind of saying, like, why are we focusing on this when you have better stuff that have ha that has higher potential? So David Sinclair is obviously a professor at Harvard Medical School, although I don't think he's a physician by training. I really enjoyed his book Lifespan, but when I'm reading it, I do get like a 10% like of me, my kind of like snake oil and mm. radar kind of gets tipped off a little bit with some of the stuff he does. Is he in this space of longevity researchers and such? Is he is he legit? Basically, what's what's his deal? Like he's legit, but he's so good at marketing. Like I, I'm, I'm actually quite impressed by him. He's a really good marketer, don't you think? He's really good at navigating that kind of world of being legit, but also being uh, interviewed on Time Magazine and uh, having bestseller books and doing you know Joe Rogan, <laughs> um, and so uh, what he does is he. Uh, converts like the scientific findings to something that is like way uh, he kind of um, extrapolates um, maybe a bit too much but he makes it compelling and what I think scientists don't like is that he he does that um, for things that are, so for, for example there's a one of his controversies is his issue with um, resveratrol and sirtuins so he needed some research that um, led to the development of, of, of a compound called, uh, or testing of a compound called resveratrol, resveratrol and other compounds are similar to it. Uh, he actually co-founded a company that was studying the effect of resveratrol and similar compounds on age-related diseases. He made like millions of this company that he sell it to, uh, he sold it to um, GSK and it flopped basically. It turned out it was, uh, yeah, it didn't work. Like they spent billions developing these drugs after they, they bought the company. And it didn't work. Um, so some people kind of accuse him of hyping up that because uh, he he's done this in the past. He's been hyping up like he, he used to hype up resveratrol and his previous research. Now he's doing this with um, information theory of aging. Um, he connects both of them in, in one single theory. But uh, some people are kind of accusing him of hyping up his uh, research to create demand for his companies. I saw this really interesting framework on a blog post ages ago, but it was about scientists and how they can basically be interesting or become good marketers and it basically said that like science as a whole i mean it can be interesting but a lot of it's pretty dry it's pretty specific but they said to unlock this kind of virality and popularity you have to fuse your science with self-help advice and i think in all the big kind of popular scientists right now so we think of like andrew huberman uh yeah. maybe peter atia to a degree definitely matthew walker the sleep guy and definitely david sinclair there's always a degree of like self-help and a uh, bit of extrapolation and a bit of like here's a mouse study and if you take the same chemicals as this mouse you're going to live to 150 so i think that's a really interesting framework where you just you you marry your science or whatever with self-help advice and uh i mean i lap it up i love it yeah it's kind of like uh, evidence-based uh self self-improvement but the thing is like um so many people get away with like talking absolute shit, right? Um, 
in the self-help world and no one bats an eyelid. But when a scientist tries to do it in an evidence-based way, he gets attacked or she gets attacked. Um, I think we kind of over-focus on, on, on scientists and people who are legit when they try and navigate that world a bit too much. Because like people are out there promoting like all all, all kinds of, of bullshit. Um, at least these people are trying to make it evidence-based and like keep it a bit grounded in science. Uh, and I think there is a, a, a bit of, I would say, like kind of jealousy towards the, people like David Sinclair from other scientists who, because like think of it this way: the kind of science world, you're working on something that is like super interesting to you, but no one else cares. Like you're the person who is like boring everyone out when you're talking about like these molecular biomedical um, <laughs> um, experiments that you're you're carrying out. When someone asks you what do you do, and you start explaining, they're like, oh, you know, this is the most boring thing ever so for those who have the ability to translate the boring stuff to more interesting stuff they become like rock stars of the science community um and i think people like scientists don't like that they so they start attacking these people um for the the, the hype they generate but i think a lot of it is, is pure jealousy so last week i was at this youtube health event in london where yeah Vishal varani is a doctor he's launched um or he's heading up uk uk's version of youtube health and there were, there were there were a few big medical youtubers on stage and i asked the question which is basically um if you want to give legit health advice or like legit self-improvement health advice it's basically pretty simple right it's like eat well sleep exercise uh be around people like it's it's not rocket science and all of this actually exists and national bodies have loads of guidelines like all the stuff that's legit basically everyone already knows about and where doctors are already advising it right but i think there's another framework or another th pressure that these health influencers feel where to be interesting you have to give something contrarian you have to say something interesting i don't think it's possible to really reach virality become really big just saying the evidence back stuff i think there has to be a degree of speculation you have to think of you know <laughs> talking about random research chemicals or random mice studies like you have to have something there so i i have a lot of sympathy for them basically i think it's a very difficult job it is yeah it, it's it's super difficult to yeah make it interesting but it's also maybe it's just like a bad business to be in although i'm guessing sinclair is probably a decker if not 100 100 centi millionaire uh and yeah, i guess he's, he's doing well yeah, and no, he, I mean, for, yeah. but that, that's the thing like he because he's really good at hype um <laughs> if he was like uh super grounded and didn't engage in hype at all he, he he wouldn't be as successful as he is but the thing is um sometimes it's not a bad thing because he's probably generated a lot of interest in the field he's probably generated brought in a lot of funding so uh, back in the day of early days of longevity uh aubrey de gray was the hype guy hype hype man right um aubrey de gray if, if you haven't heard of him he was the first person to give like a he gave a ted talk back in the day about radical life extension he founded the sens foundation s-e-n-s -E by the way he was the original david sinclair he he was like a big hype uh, longevity person uh, and he probably like single-handedly kick-started a huge industry and uh, a lot of funding into in, in, into this space a lot of what he said wasn't evidence-based but it was uh it was kind of like optimistic, uh, like a very optimistic way of interpreting uh, science. Um, and I think like, the, like, there's always going to be the pessimists who, who, put, who put the optimists down, and they're right. Like Pessimists are always right, but uh, the optimists are the ones who kind of drive things forward. If you're David Sinclair and you had his clout and his uh, name brand recognition in the space... I would uh, retire. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how are you making... But you, you just want to do a cash grab. You just want to make a ton of money. What what would you do? Would you do like a supplement? Would you do a business? Well, that's what he did. He, he literally, that's literally what he did. He's done <laughs> he that. Yeah, he created a company basically uh, that was looking into a resveratrol supplement. And he's on, uh, I think he's on, uh, he's part of companies doing NMN, which is another supplement that doesn't work. <laughs> is, is that the money? Because I can imagine if you're like a um, rich tech person in the u.s and you're set on living for ages i'm guessing he's top of your kind of list of people to call up is there much money in kind of personalized coaching i i'm guessing i don't think someone decent. like david sinclair would be a good coach like these people <laughs> uh most of these uh scientists who are, who are popular in this space 
all their experiences dealing with mice. So unless you're a, a, a mouse, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't call up David Sinclair. <laughs> That's where like Peter T is quite uh, interesting because he is an actual actual physician who deals with with patients. That's where I, what I do basically. I translate all the stuff that comes from uh, basic research and clinical research into like actionable advice with patients. Uh, it's a totally different world because you need to be grounded, like, or you're going to like harm the patient. 